We're now going to be talking about the phenomenon of inductance, which is when the these moving currents inside of these, these changing currents inside of circuits induce a magnetic field, which in turn leads to resistance to having that current flow. Um, so we will start with defining mutual inductance. Mutual inductance is when a changing current uh, in one wire uh, or circuit element leads to a magnetic leads to the creation of the of a magnetic field that in turn leads to a change in the magnetic flux of another circuit element and leads which leads to a current um, or a change in potential in the other um, in another component of the circuit. So here you can see two coils. Um, and coil one has current flowing through it. That current leads to a magnetic field. The magnetic, as, as this current um, changes and changes the magnetic field through coil two, that in turn induces a, uh, a current in the second magnet, uh, in the second circuit element. So this is mutual inductance. This we will learn more about this. This is how uh, how transformers work when you want to change the voltage um, from whatever comes from the line to some other voltage. So mutual induction, in the mutual inductance, if you have several turns of wire, is equal to the um, the number of turns in in so the second coil um, times the chain, the flux in the second coil divided by the current in the first coil. We can look at the so the induced um, the induced potential in coil one is equal to negative the inductance times the changing current in coil two, and the induced potential in coil two is equal to the negative of the inductance times the change in the time derivative of the change of in current one. Um, so here you can see an example. You have heating coils in an electric clothes dryer, and you counterwind them so that their magnetic fields uh, cancel each other out. And when you do this, this reduces the mutual inductance um, so because the magnetic field from the, the, the current going in one direction cancels out the magnetic field from the current going in the other direction so that you actually have little or no magnetic field. And that means that these, uh, so this coil no longer acts to, uh, this coil is no longer creating a magnetic field. You don't really want a large magnetic field by your clothes dryer, but you do need that heating element to work. And the way that heating element works is that you send a lot of current through effectively a very large resistor and when you do that it heats up that's what makes your dryer work you don't want your dryer to uh, demagnetize your credit card which you actually accidentally sent through the dryer and you don't want it to attract all the bolts in the area and you don't want it to take a really long time to turn on because of the mutual inductance in the coil itself okay so then we can go to an example and I won't work through the exact same the example the exact same way that the book does, but uh, we will talk about how uh, what the considerations are. So here you have a solenoid, and you have a um, you have a loop of wire outside of that solenoid, um, and uh, and then the question is what is the mutual inductance of the two coils? The way that we would work that out is to first calculate the magnetic flux. So um, if you calculate the magnetic flux of the, the magnetic flux of the second coil is to the second coil, um, the magnetic flux on coil two due to coil one is equal to the magnetic field in coil one which is mu naught times the number of turns per unit length in coil one uh, times the current in coil one 
that is the magnetic field. And then the, um, you can treat the magnetic, uh, you can treat a solenoid as if it has magnetic field only in the middle and the, the magnetic field is approximately zero outside of the solenoid. So then we only have to worry when we, so this is the magnetic field and we want to multiply by the area and the relevant area because there's only field inside of the inner coil is pi r1 squared. And then our equation for the mutual inductance is that it is the number of turns in coil 2 times the flux in coil 1, in coil 2 from coil 1, and divided by the current from 1. So that, uh, and this should be inductant, the number of turns in length 1. And then, yeah, then we can plug this in here, and we get that the inductance is N2, N1, the I1s cancel out, pi R1 squared divided by the length. And I dropped my mu naught. I want to keep my mu naught here. Okay, so then um, you can plug those, you can plug in the numbers. So if you are given the number of, of turns per unit length for the outer coil, you can calculate what the change, in, what the mutual inductance is between these two coils. And then using that, you can calculate what the change in potential is um, as you crank up and down the current through the, the inductor. All right, moving on to self-inductance. So when you, um, when you have a changing current in a wire, then you are, uh, you are changing the magnetic flux through the loop, and that itself creates a potential difference because the, the magnetic field through the wire is actually changing. So this, this is called self-inductance, where the wire itself resists changing uh, the current because you're generating a magnetic field when you do that. So if you have multiple loops of wire, then the total flux is the number of loops times the number of times the flux in one loop, and this is equal to uh, the inductance times the current. And this inductance, then in this case, is a is not so straightforward to calculate. Um, so it, we usually consider it as a property of the inductor. So you have an object which acts which has self inductance, and you would give you would measure the you would have some measurement of the inductance of that inductor on its own and the si unit for inductance is henry's all right and then the, you can think of this as a definition of self inductance the um, the potential induced is equal to negative l times di dt so the inductance is how, is the coefficient of the time derivative of current, of current the, the negative of the coefficient of the time derivative of the current when you, so how, which tells you how the um, potential changes. Or we can write this as the inductance is defined as the potential divided by di dt, and we are primarily concerned with the absolute value of that quantity. All right, and the symbol used to represent an inductor in a circuit is this curly wire, as if you had a little solenoid. So I want to contrast this with our symbol for a resistor. The resistor is spiky, and the inductor is coily. As a physicist, my artistic abilities are limited, so I try to exaggerate those features when drawing to make sure that you don't confuse my inductors with my resistors. All right, so there are, here you can see some pictures of inductors, um, and 
you will work with some inductors in the lab for this class. All right, so the induced voltage in an inductor always acts to oppose the change in current. Um, so while the physical configuration of inductors can be different from a, while, from a coil uh, of wire, you can always conceptually think of an inductor as a coil of wire. So then when you have current traveling through in this direction, um, that's telling you that a positive charge wants to move in this direction. The induced potential is positive here, negative here. It's going to try to get the current to flow in the opposite direction. Now, that's if you have, sorry, that's if the current is increasing in this direction, then your induced electrom your induced potential has a positive, is positive here and negative here. If you have decreasing current, the induced electric potential is positive here and negative here. Now, switch it, your current is flowing this way. If it's increasing, then you're going to have a positive voltage here and a negative voltage here. If your current's flowing this way and it is decreasing, you're going to have a positive voltage here and a negative voltage here. All right, so then um, this example in the book is rather involved. So I'm not going to go through all of the example. This is for a coaxial cable. Uh, you guys are mostly considerably younger than me, but if you remember something called cable TV, then you would have seen coaxial cables, and they in fact have um, you. They in fact have some self-inductance. All right. Now, what are inductors good for? We're going to be talking about circuits involving inductors. And we're going to talk about all of the different combinations culminating in RLC circuits. <clears throat> if you guys are in differential equations, you may have solved the, the equations for an RLC circuit. Um, and we will, I will do it for you here. But if you are not comfortable with it, you can skip through that part. All right. So an RL circuit is a circuit that has a resistor and an inductor. Um, so similar to what we were doing when we were talking about capacitance, um, we're going to think look at what happens when you charge up and discharge an inductor. All right. So here you have you can have a switch which does uh, which has two different ways you can close it so that when you close the first switch you end up with this circuit. You have a potential and an inductor and, an and a resistor, or you can close this switch and leave this one open, in which case you have no potential inside the closed circuit. So we are going to start with a configuration where there is, there's no circuit, and then we hook up our battery. Now, when we hook up our battery, this region is entirely at the same potential and this region is at the same potential. And current is going to flow to try to make the potential constant, or it's always going to, you're always going to have current flowing from high potential down to low potential. So when you close this circuit, you're going to get current flowing in this direction. Um, so when you do that, uh, you're going to start, you're going to have current flowing through the inductor like this, and it is going to, the current is increasing. If the current is increasing, the induced potential is going to be, uh, you're going to try to fight it, so the induced potential is positive here, negative there, to try to get the current to, uh, to try to get the current to stop, basically. So you want to slow down or stop the change in the current. So then when you reach an equilibrium state, so you've got current flowing through the entire circuit, um, eventually it will reach a steady state where um, the magnetic flux through the inductor is no longer changing because uh, you've, you've slowly ramped up the, um, you've slowly ramped up the current. Now 
we are going to flip these switches and allow current to uh, allow the current to travel around the battery. And when we do that, um, now your this region is all at zero is all at the low potential, and you're you're going to end up then getting current traveling from here to there. So you're going to induce a, a, a potential difference that has a positive that is higher here than there. So you're going to induce a uh, change in the um, in the you're going to induce a potential across the inductor to try to combat the um, the change in the potential and the try to combat the change in the current traveling through the circuit. All right, so then we can take this circuit here and we can apply, we're gonna look at, uh, we are gonna look at the, this one right, oh no, this one right here, and we're gonna apply Kirchhoff's law. So we're gonna travel around this circuit and we go up, so we have the potential jumps up and then we have a decrease in the potential as you go from here to there that is equal to the inductance times the change in current per unit time. And then we have another decrease in potential as you drop across the resistor. So we get this differential equation. What do I mean by a differential equation? A differential equation is an equation where you have derivatives of, an, of a variable and the variable itself, and you have some relationship between the derivative, derivative or derivatives of the variable and itself. So in this case, the potential is constant, the inductance is constant, the resistance is constant, and everything else is in the current, and the current alone is changing. So I'm going to take this equation and divide through by the resistance. And this guy goes away. So I'm gonna rewrite that equation. Well, let me just, it's easier to see if I do divide by the resistance. So then I get the voltage over the resistance minus L over R VI dt minus I equals zero. So now, um, for those of you who have had differential equations, this is going to look familiar. If you haven't had differential equations, I'm going to try to show you how to do this in a way that you can follow. One of the most common ways, one of the easiest ways to solve differential equations is to make an educated guess. So you're going to try to guess what the, um, what the solution is and see if you can put in a test solution that makes it work. So I am looking here for something for a function whose derivative is uh, whose derivative looks kind of like itself. So now I'm going to put in a now I have the benefit of actually knowing the answer as well as a couple decades experience on you. So I'm going to guess that uh, my current looks like some constant plus some other constant e to the negative b times d. And now I'm going, so if I think my uh, solution has this form, I can take the derivative, plug it back in, and see if I can find constants a, b, and that should be a c, that will, act, that will solve this problem. All right, so 
D I D T is negative B C E to the negative C T. And now I'm going to plug that in here. So everywhere, this is my I. Everywhere I have I, I'm going to plug in this. And everywhere where I have di dt, I'm going to plug in this expression. So I get v over r minus l over r times negative b c e to the negative c t. And then minus I equals zero. All right, so now here's another trick. Here I have stuff that falls off exponentially, and here I have constants. So if I want this solution to be true for all time, my coefficients of e to the negative ct have to cancel each other out. And my, co my constants have to cancel each other out. So then I can use that to split this into two equations, v over r minus a equals zero, or this works if a equals v over r. And then I have the coefficients of c e to the negative t, l over r b c minus b c equals zero. And when I do that, uh, oh, this one, I have a mistake. There's no c there. So when I do that, my b's cancel out, and I get C equals R over L. And then I get the solution that the current has to equal V over R. That is what it would do without the inductor and then plus some constant, which I'm going to suggestively call I naught, E to the negative R T over L. All right, and I can rewrite this equation as V over R plus I naught E to the negative T over tau, where tau is equal to L over R. So this has units of time. That's going to tell me a measure of how long it takes for this inductor to, to relax, how long it takes for this, this extra term in the current to go to zero. And so this is, we want to check our solution. So if we remove, ah, if we remove the inductor, it doesn't quite make sense because we, we can't just put in L equals zero because we divide by zero. It would change the differential equation back here. Um, but we can see that this term is what we get simply from having the circuit um, charge up. And then you have to consider what happens uh, initially. So if you're 
In the case of this circuit, we started charged up, and um, we're going to approach a current of zero. So if you, so you need in the case where the capacitance, where the inductance is discharging, you would have something this would be negative because you want the current to go to zero so you would have uh, one let's see, you would have one minus e to the negative r t let me just put t over tau so if your inductor is discharging, then you have this solution where the current eventually goes to zero. Ah, let's see, yeah, because this, this term, this will go to infinity. Uh, actually, I want the current to go to zero when I'm discharging, and that means that actually for discharging, I want the current to equal the initial current e to the negative t over tau. Discharging, eventually this one will, this current will go to zero. If I have the, um, if I have this hooked up where it is charging, eventually I want this to go to this potential. So I am going to have this form. So that eventually this term goes to zero and I reach the current that I would have if I didn't have the inductor at all. Um, so these are both special cases of this form with the, the constants set to match the initial conditions. And so if you have never taken differential equations, this is the standard approach. You solve the differential equations and the differential equation and you get some general form, but then for your specific case, you have to figure out what those constants are. Now, when in the context of this class, I want to warn you in particular about using the book and just plucking an equation out of the book. You have to, so there are multiple solutions of this differential equation. Your answers are basically all going to have a form like this, but you're going to have to pick the right one, and the right one is going to depend on the physical situation. So you should be asking yourself, does your current go to zero in, uh, with, as time goes to infinity, in which case you want this solution, or does your current equal go to some steady state as time goes to infinity, in which case you're going to want this answer. All right, so here you can see a plot of what happens to the electric current um, as time goes on and the um, electric potential as time goes on if you go back to this circuit. So the electric current gradually approaches what you would get if you didn't have the inductor at all because the inductor slowly allows the current to slowly change but it does it just as it's okay with current it's just not okay with change. And here, what happens is that the potential across the, um, across the inductor starts very lar large because you have a rapidly changing current, and it gradually goes to zero as the inductor gets used to the change that you're forcing upon it. And then here, this is what happens in figure C across the inductor. Um, as, so the last one is you remove the battery and hook up the wires, and over time the current, the potential across the inductor also goes back to zero. All right, so here if you have a generator uh, which produces square waves um, in an RL circuit, so you're turning the, the potential, you're 
flipping the sign of the potential that you're applying. Um, what happens across the inductor is that you, that you will get these spikes where it's resisting change and then it slowly gets used to it. And then you force it to change again and then it gets used to it. So you can end up getting, um, you can use this for instance for a strobe light and getting multiple flashes. All right, so then LC circuits, we can consider what happens to LC circuits where we instead of applying, a, um, instead of applying a, this is when we add a capacitor. So we're not gonna ask how the capacitor got charged up, um, but we insert a charged up capacitor. And if you have positive charge here and negative charge there, you hook it up to an inductor. It is going to, um, it's going to slow, it's going to put push current through here. It's gonna be very slow about pushing current here. As it, the inductor resists having the current cycle through, so it resists having the capacitor discharged. As the capacitor is being discharged, you're building up a, a potential, um, you're changing the, so here this is the current across the, um, the this is the charge across the capacitor is decreasing and then as the charge across the capacitor decreases you are um, this is the current in the inductor so the current in the inductor is slowly increases until it starts to push back and then it uh, and then that will start charging up the capacitor again. And then the capacitor starts discharging, which leads the inductor's current to increase, which it leads to a potential difference across that. So you get this oscillatory behavior where the charge is, the capacitor is discharging. It gets as much charge as possible up there, but then the fact that the capacitance is taking a lot of energy, it forces it, the, the charge back through the inductor and recharges the capacitor. So you end up with the charge across the capacitor oscillating. Um, and that is somewhat easier to understand in an RLC circuit. So an LC circuit, an RC circuit, and an LR circuit are all variations of an LRC circuit where one of those components is set to zero. So we're gonna look at that um, in that particular, uh, so that particular situation in greater detail. So an LRC circuit is one that has an inductor, a resistor, and a capacitor, and you can flip the battery on and off, or you can start applying an oscillatory, vo oscillatory potential, which we will get to in a bit. All right, so now this is our equation for the potential, or sorry, for the, this is our coupled differential equation for an LRC circuit. Now, I know you guys haven't had differential equations. I don't see it. You guys, you guys, oh, I, I know you're good. I know that you can follow what I'm doing because you've been introduced to derivatives already. So the current is just the time derivative of charge. So whereas before we had the potential times, we, we, had, uh, we had the current, we're now gonna look at the charge and not the current because what the capacitance is related to the total charge. And then the um, derivative where we had the, the first derivative of the current, the first derivative of the current is proportional to the second derivative of the, well, is the second derivative of the charge. So this is the, uh, we're gonna use the fact that I equals dQdt and di is, di dt is just the second derivative with respect to time of the current. And now, 
we are going to note that we don't have that applied voltage in there. And when we have, uh, so we're not yet considering a, an applied voltage. We are just, uh, we're just going to consider these circuit elements on their own. Uh, an applied voltage would mean that you would set this equal to a constant. Okay, so now we're going to have a test solution. Our test solution is that the charge is Q naught cosine omega T plus some phase shift. Um, and that is because we're looking for something where it's the function looks like its first derivative and its second derivative. I actually have to modify this slightly. We need, so we need, an, we are going to need a damped solution. So we're going to need, put an e to the negative. I will just put it in as t over tau, and we're going to plug this in and see what the solution is, and see it. Well, see, we will see that this works, or I would not have done it. Um, and then our first derivative is negative omega q naught sine omega t plus phi naught e to the negative t over tau and then plus, ah, plus and minus P over tau here. I'm just applying the chain rule. You do not need to know how to do this. I am doing it because apparently I like ugly equations. because when we take the second derivative, this is going to get uglier. So that's the derivative of this term, and then I have to, I have to take the derivative of this term. Don't, I'm taking the time derivative. This should be a 1 over tau, not a t over tau. All right, then at this point, I wonder why I chose to do this example, but I did, so I'm going to stick with it. I will start with the, I'm going to actually start with this term, Q naught 
over the capacitance cosine omega t plus phi naught e to the negative t over tau plus r times this term. So I have minus omega r q naught sine omega t plus phi naught e to the negative t over tau minus r over tau q naught cosine omega t plus phi naught e to the negative t over tau. And then the inductance times this. So minus L omega squared Q naught cosine omega T plus phi E to the negative T over tau plus L over tau omega Q naught sine omega T plus phi naught e to the negative t over tau plus uh, this one should read one so l over tau omega q naught sine omega t plus phi naught e to the negative t over tau plus l q naught over tau squared cosine omega t plus phi naught e to the negative t over tau equals zero. And I have e to the negative t over tau terms everywhere, so I can cancel them out. And now I'm going to collect like terms. So I'm going to use the same trick that I used before, where if I have some function, and I want this to be true everywhere, the coefficients of that function must equal, uh, must equal zero here. So now my cosine terms are here. I've got four of them. And my sine terms are, I should have, okay, I have three plus four. I have seven terms. Yeah, I've got three sine terms. And four cosine terms. And that's going to give us two equations. And we have two unknowns. Our unknowns are omega and tau. So we are going to try to solve for omega and tau with those. So my cosine coefficients. Oh, the other thing is that I have this Q naught everywhere. And I'm just going to cancel it out because I don't need to have that. So then my cosine terms, the coefficient of my cosine terms are 1 over C minus R over tau minus L omega squared plus L over tau squared equals zero. My sine coefficients are negative omega r plus L omega over tau plus L over, oh, this is a plus, I have two omega taus. 
two L omega tau's. zero and when we have this we can solve for tau the omegas cancel out and we get tau equals 2 L over R and miraculously I didn't make if I did make any stupid algebra mistakes they weren't there um, and then I am after omega. So now I can plug this in here. I can plug this answer for tau in here and look for some simplifications. 1 over C minus tau over R over tau is going to give us the R's cancel out. And I get 1 over 2L. And here I have minus L omega squared. And then I have plus L over. 4L squared times R squared. I'm going to make some simplifications, so I'm going to cancel out that L here. And that all has to equal 0. I think this There's an, that's an R squared. Here, I made a mistake because R over tau does not give two, 1 over 2L. It gives, oh, this marker has just stopped working. It gives R squared over 2L. So these two terms have the same units, and I am going to divide through by L so that I get closer. I'm going to divide through by L and then move this term on the other side. So I get omega squared equals 1 over LC. And then here I have a plus r squared over 2l squared. And that gives me my omega. So that's the solution. You've seen it once. You are not expected to reproduce it. All right, and with that, we're going to move on to some examples. Uh, so first, describe how the currents through the two resistors vary with time after the switch is closed. So when the switch is closed, um, then everything's going to move to the potential epsilon. That means that you're going to get a current through here. When you get a current through here, you're going to induce a current across the inductor, um, which is going to bite the change. It will exponentially decay. And eventually, you will end up getting uh, um, you will end up getting a, the current exponentially decaying through here. Um, and then, if we look at what this looks like in the um, in the long run um, at equilibrium, the inductor does nothing. So at equilibrium, we're going to approach a circuit with a potential epsilon, R1 and R2. Ah, so initially, 
you're going to have all of the current going through R, or more, much more of the current going through R1 because the, the inductor is, redu is fighting current going through R2 because it doesn't want to build up any, um, it doesn't want the magnetic field inside the inductor to change. And that's going to exponentially decay, and you're going to end up with at equilibrium with the two resistors in parallel. So you're going to exp you're going to start with it looking like you have just R1, and then it's going to approach having R1 and R2 in parallel. All right, the current shown in it, shown here is it sh here. This current is increasing. Here, this current is decreasing. Determine which end of the inductor is at higher potential. Okay, so if the current is going in this direction, the induced potential is going to have a higher value here than there because it's trying to push the charge in the opposite direction. Now, and that's when the current is increasing. If the current is in this direction and decreasing, then the inductor is going to act to try to keep the current the same so that the magnetic flux is the same. So you're going to have a higher potential here than there. So in both cases, you have the same the, the direction of the induced potential is the same. It's just that in this case, it's because the current is this way in increasing, and in that case, it's because it's that way in decreasing. Either way, you're going to try to keep the, um, your, the inductor is going to have the same potential because it's fighting to keep the potential across the inductor. It's fighting to keep the magnetic flux the same in the inductor. All right, so here you have a current through a five microhenry inductor, and it varies with time. The um, resistance of the inductor, um, it's giving you the resistance of the inductor, uh, and we will just set this problem up, not, uh, not actually do it. So here we've got part A. The slope is, there's a given slope here, there's a different slope here, and a different slope here. So I'm going to bring those over here. In A, the um, di dp is 6 amps over 3 milliseconds. So 6 over 3 millisecond amps per second, or 2 times 10 to the third amps per second. And then this is asking the voltage across the inductor. So that's a little tricky. This problem is a little trickier than it looks like at first um, because you have to consider what the voltage is, you have to do this in steps. So our general, um, so first of all, the voltage across the inductor, the induced potential is negative of the inductance D by, or let's, let's see, the I dt all right and all that matters here for the potential is the change in okay all that matters is the potential the change in the current so the induced potential is 5 times 10 to the negative 3 microhenries times 2 times 10 to the 3 amps per second, or sorry, henries, because I already did the conversion, and these guys cancel, and you get a potential of negative 10 volts. Part B, you we decrease in 1, 2, 3 seconds, we decrease 3 amps. So di dt is negative 3 amps in, uh, in 3 
microseconds. So this is negative 10 to the third amps per second. And the induced potential is negative 5 times 10 to the negative 3 henrys times negative 10 to the 3 amps per second is 5 volts. C. D I D T is we decrease 3 amps, so negative 3 amps in 6 microseconds is 0.5. I'll just leave it there. So a negative 0.5 times 10 to the third amps per second. So the induced potential is negative 5 times 10 to the negative 3 henrys times negative 0.5 times 10 to the 3 amps per second is 0.5. These guys cancel out. So 0.5 times 5 is 2.5 volts. All right, here, this one says, how long after the switch, switch S1 is thrown does it take the current in the circuit to reach half of its maximum value? Uh, and express your answer in terms of the time constant of the circuit. So, we actually don't need to know the time constant of the circuit. Um, we know, in this case, where it's asking us the current so the current as a function of time is going to equal whatever it levels off to. And initially, the current is going to be the, so initially, you have no current, and the inductor is fighting the change. Um, and then, when does it reach? Uh, and th uh, this is, yeah. When does it reach its equilibrium, or when does it reach half of its maximum value? So I over I naught equals... One half equals one minus e to the negative p over tau. And then we will rearrange this. e to the negative p over tau equals one half negative t over tau equals natural log of one half, which equals the negative natural log of two. So the time is equal to tau times the natural log of 2. OK, now this one uses the result we just got, tau equals uh, or that the time for it to reach half of its uh, value is tau times the natural log of 2. And we also know that, uh, so we can use this to solve for tau, because we're given tau, the, the time for half of it. So tau equals t 1 half over the natural log of 2. And then we use the expression for tau. which is L over R, and it says uh, if the resistance, let's see, 
if the find the resistance if the inductance is so many uh, micro henrys so now the resistance is the inductance times natural log of 2 divided by the time for it to reach one half of its maximum uh, of its maximum current. And with that, we'll end. I'll see you guys for the next one.